Well, let me begin by first thanking Steve for his leadership of the Alumni Association over the last 12 months. I had the opportunity to get a first-hand seat to observe the care, the diligence, the thoughtfulness with which Steve had led the association these past 12 months. It has been an absolute pleasure to work alongside you, Steve, to learn from you, to call you a friend, and I aspire to replicate the work that you have done as we take the association forward. So thank you. Please join me in thanking Steve. In fact, it is a deep honor to be serving as the 129th president of the Alumni Association, recognizing that it is a long established tradition. There are many past presidents, including many who are in the room here today, Annalisa Weisel, Charlene Capsonell, Eric Caulfield, Honye. In fact, if I can ask each Alumni Association past president to stand and be recognized, thank you. I came to MIT 35 years ago from very humble beginnings, a young boy from the Caribbean, small island in the Caribbean. And the six years that I spent here, four years as an undergraduate, two years as a graduate student, were transformational. They changed the trajectory of my life. And for that, I am eternally grateful. And it's remarkable, I've had the opportunity to talk to many of you here today and fellow alumni over the years around the world, and the story is remarkably the same. And what that says to me is when you pull back the curtain, the magic of MIT in the end is that MIT transforms lives so that we can transform the world. And I think that's what binds us together. That's what calls us to serve, to ensure that that transformational quality remains true for generations to come. So it is with that, it is through that lens and against that backdrop that I stand here before you today to follow another tradition of giving you an update of the state of the state of the Alumni Association. Let me start by saying thank you. Thank you to the Alumni Association staff under the leadership of Whitney and the executive directors, the institute leaders, the corporation under Mark's leadership, the Alumni Association past presidents for all that they have done to prepare me, to welcome me, to guide me for this very important role. So I thought I would start by, before we look at the year ahead, by just looking at where we have been in the past 12 months. So looking back in FY23, perhaps it's best to start with a look of the MIT community of alumni by the numbers, for in fact, that's what resonates best in an MIT crowd. The fiscal year 2020, the MIT Alumni Association helped to engage 60% of the alumni community. And that engagement encompasses everything from event attendance, volunteering, logging in on the infinite connection, giving, and more. In addition, philanthropic efforts led to us reaching $84.2 million in annual giving contributions from 35,000 alumni and friends, donors contributing to the overall giving at MIT. To get to success like this, yes. <laughs> to get to success like this is truly a team effort. It is thanks to everyone here in this room for what you have done as volunteers, as well as to Whitney and her team 
and partners across the Institute. So once again, let's celebrate these, these accomplishments. This engagement happened across several fronts. As you can see shown here on this slide, just a few of the remarkable activities that have been held all over the world. From signature events such as the Alumni Association Reunion and ALC, to novel programming like the online MIT Alumni Forum series and regional serve and celebrate events to career development opportunities like the Alumni Advisors Hub and Career Design Fellowship, to annual giving efforts such as the MIT 24 Challenge and Giving Tuesday and the All Class Given, to the virtual engagement that is happening through the Infinite Connection, and of course, scores of engagement opportunities offered up by clubs, groups, and more. The association continues to be a big tent under which all the community is welcome and can find common ground. And as our alumni engage with one another throughout the world, we also continue to facilitate the relationships of our alumni with the Institute being a channel for sharing alumni sentiment about events and decisions with institute leadership on campus. The four areas of most considerable interest were free expression, the strategic plan for belonging, achievement, and composition, the graduate student union, and access to campus following COVID. The MIT Alumni Association continues to partner closely with MIT on understanding alumni perspectives and addressing any concerns or ideas that might flow through. The MIT Alumni Association also continues to select a pipeline of alumni volunteers into the governance structure of MIT, offering their alumni perspectives to discussions about the present and future of the Institute. This includes alumni nominees to the corporation, as noted with the recent inductees, Steve, Nelson, and Amen. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> this is also the add-in of recent graduate to the alumni corp to the corporation, as well as leadership roles to visiting committee members. Thank you for all of you that have nominated and recommended names of your peers who you think would be great to serve in this capacity, and please keep the nominations coming. All right, so that was the year that was. Let's turn our focus now to the year ahead. I want to pause and provide a snapshot of what the community looks like as of now. As of July 1st, 2023, we are just shy of 140,000 alumni around the planet. That is remarkable. And as you can see here, this is how the community is broken down by gender, by degree, and by US versus international. When you consider the individual alumni experiences behind these numbers, our unique identities, perspectives, career paths, needs, and more, you realize how broad and encompassing our big tent needs to be to remain welcoming and relevant to alumni no matter where they live, in the world, and in their stage of career. Such a comprehensive aim needs to have a commensurately comprehensive plan. For those of you who can recall, the association's previous strategic plan was launched in 2018 with a five-year horizon. And I don't need to tell you how much has changed in the last five years. As the plan has reached its completion last year, Whitney and Steve tasked an ad hoc committee to re-energize the plan for a shorter three-year sprint. 
the new plan, which we affectionately call SB 26. It is intentional and flexible at the implementation level, and our intention is to align with President Kornblatt and her priorities and vision. It was created in true partnership between the board, the ad hoc SB 26 committee, the staff, to ensure that its success is implemented and practical. It fundamentally allows us to answer three specific questions. Where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? And most importantly, how will we know that we have arrived? You'll be hearing more about the plan and the role that you, representing the various roles that you have as volunteers and leaders of our community, will play as we go forward. While the MIT Alumni Association continue to sustain and enhance the engagement of all alumni, the above are cohorts our data suggest needs focus and prioritization over the next three years. This means that the association, both in Cambridge and in partnership with our volunteers around the globe, will continue to work together to find ways to strengthen and develop programs to engage alumni and alumnae in underrepresented groups, our most recent alumni, and our vast graduate student population, which is significantly international. And of course, we'll continue to sustain and enhance the engagement experience of all alumni. We have recently established a targeted goal of no less than 60% engagement by FY26. This, springs, the board, this spring, the board has established a 60% engagement goal by the end of the plan. But you can see that we have already reached that. So the challenge is how far can we stretch? How far can we go in that spirit of MIT-ness? We are walking the balance of being optimistic and maintaining what we can achieve within a realistic time frame, mindful of the complexities that lie ahead. One of the aims of SP26 is to ensure that the association can break through the noisy world in which we live today, to connect with our alumni, to focus our signal. In addition to a happy return to in-person events around the world, we also know that we need the right tools to facilitate this type of connection. The MIT alumni online community is the new official home for more than 200 volunteer led clubs, classes, and groups for the MIT alumni and friends. It is powered by Hivebright, which is replacing the association's previous online community platform, Encompass. You'll be hearing more about this and the new online experience, which promises to provide a simple, intuitive interface across user-friendly platforms so you can stay connected with, you, with your fellow alumni community as well as the Institute. I do want to thank the staff and a small but mighty group of volunteers that served as a pilot group to ensure that we got through all of the bugs. And the system began launch in waves a few weeks ago. A major point of strategic energy within the new plan is celebrating the arrival of our new president, Sally Kornblatt. During the first full academic year of her leadership, the Alumni Association is leading in partnership with Resource Development and the Office of the President, a presidential welcome tour focused on connecting Sally with the global MIT community of alumni and friends. As President Kornberg recently shared with alumni, as well as parents of undergraduate students and key non-alumni donors, she will be going to, she'll be going on the road to extend her listening tour 
with these key constituencies. Stops along the tour will include the regions where we have the greatest presence of alumni shown here. She kicked off this effort in earnest with the tech reunion in May when she sat down with past Alumni Association President Steve Baker for a fireside chat. Beginning next month, the president will be visiting alumni in New York, San Francisco, and London, and we're working on additional stops in FY25. And it feels like this might be a great place for me to wrap up. We've talked about the past, where we have been. We've talked about the future, where we are going together. The state of the Alumni Association is strong. It is due in large part to all that you do as leaders. We thank you for your service, and we look forward to the year ahead. Thank you, everyone. Well, now that uh, you all have heard about the work of the Alumni Association, uh, I thought it would be helpful and interesting and maybe even fun to have Robert um, join me up here and we'll just ask him a few questions about himself and get to know the president of the Alumni Association just a little bit better. All right, come on over, Robert. Ooh. The proverbial hot seat. The hot seat. Yes. <laughs> this is going to be friendly. All right, are, my, are microphones working? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, you've had a lot of alumni volunteer experience. Yes. And I wonder if, as you reflect on that, uh, any set of experiences or just your philosophy about all of those experiences, how do those inform how you think about the presidency? Um, you know, what did you learn along the way that makes you feel like, this is gonna be fine. I, I, yes. I'm, 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 I'm ready to be um, the leader of this organization. Well, it's remarkable. And first of all, thank you for the question. One of the things, it's a question that I get asked quite frequently is, you went to MIT, what did you learn? And one of the things that I've come to realize is many of the things that I have learned in the classes I've since forgotten. Like I've forgotten Laplace transforms, Fourier analysis, Reynolds numbers. I can say the words, but I don't really know what they mean anymore. <laughs> but what, what, I, what has stayed with me is a few things. One is the ability to learn, mm -hmm. and in that, in and of itself, brings a strong sense of confidence that you can face into any new challenge and break it down to first principles, solve the problem, and then ladder back up aggregated backup, and I think that is something that has held true. Yeah. It is probably the same approach that I'm bringing to the presidency in terms of trying to understand the first, the first principles of what makes the association work, mm -hmm. and then more importantly, how we can make it better as we go forward. That's a, a great answer, and I can already say that we had our first um, board meeting, our quarterly meeting yesterday, and that went tremendously well, and uh, everyone's feeling excited about the year ahead. And you know, the Alumni Association president serves as an advisor to, as you heard from Robert, the Institute, and to me as we kind of navigate things forward. So as part of the, I can say GPS, but I don't really know how it works, yes. um, part of the GPS for the Alumni Association, you are um, already contributing mightily, so thank you. Um, as part of that leadership, you know, it's a huge community, 147,000 alumni around the world. And I wonder if you have thoughts on, you know, as we think about our volunteers who are doing so much good in the world, how, how would you want us to think about being institute citizens in this time? It's kind of different for each decade, sometimes for each year. What do you think about when you think about being an institute citizen? Yes. To answer that question, I'm going to go back to, so I've, I've known Mark Gornberg, and I, I'm looking across to see if he's still there. I can't see him through the, but I've known Mark for a few, a few decades now, is, and, yeah. and stepping into this role, Mark and I had a chat probably about a month ago, and he said something that really stuck with me that sort of 
brought into focus what it means to be an MIT alumni citizen. And he said, it's a combination of being a servant and at the same time being the chief ambassador. And that really resonated with me. Because I think if th those two things are true, but they're equally powerful at the same time. Because one of the things that, that, that binds us together is a love, a passion for MIT, for the experience that we've had, for what it represents in the world. In the board meeting yesterday, we, we had the pleasure of listening to Alfred Einstein talk about the world perception. They ran a recent survey on the world perception of MIT. And there were some, some themes that came through that were so compelling that said that the external community view MIT as a beacon of hope, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That have unwavering confidence in that MIT can solve hard problems. So as citizens of the Institute, it's probably our role to amplify that message to connect with our fellow alumni, to be the human APIs, to be the catalyst within the environment, to mobilize, connect, energize, inspire our fellow alumni. Because you know, I used to live in Coolidge Corner, which is a 21-minute walk from here. <laughs> now I live in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> which is, I haven't done the math of how long it is to walk. Forget 21 it. hours, maybe. It's 14, it's 27 hours in the air. And what you realize is when you leave, the further you get from MIT in today's noisy world, you lose track of all of the magical things that are going on here. It is our role, it is our opportunity to amplify that message to really energize our alumni so that they stay connected, so that they are energized, so that they continue to play the role that they can to transform the planet. And you have a special perspective on that as someone who lives internationally, who um, was uh, born internationally, came to the United States for school, spent a lot of time here. Is there anything else you want to say about the global international connection and how we might um, make sure we pay attention to that community, even as in the strategic plan, we're focusing on uh, a couple different cohorts, including graduate student exclusives who are largely international. Well, it's something that I'm passionate about, um, just being international by design and now living so far away on the other side of the planet. It's remarkable when you, when you live in Melbourne, Australia, how different the perspective is of this part of the world. And when you live here, how different your perspective is of that part of the world. That in and of itself is a bit of a mind trip. However, what I do realize is that is an opportunity for MIT. That is an opportunity for us to continue to stay relevant, to amplify our signal, to cut through the noise, to, to activate our alumni at a distance. I travel a lot for work. I've got a, a regional role that takes me through Asia Pacific. And one of the things I try to do is connect with alumni in every city that I travel to. Some are here. I think I saw Paul here from um, Singapore. We had uh, we dinner with the Singapore alumni community there. And, and she said that she's going to be here. So I hope she's here. I think I saw her earlier. There she is, yes. Excellent. There she is. Coming. All the way from Singapore. Yeah. And what you realize is, as I, as I alluded to earlier, Alumni come together, in my mind, for one of three reasons. One is for the fellowship, to connect and, and, and socialize. Two is for learning, that lifelong learning, and feeding that intellectual curiosity that we all have. But then three is to find a way to have an impact yeah. beyond your day job. And the opportunity to do that at scale in the outer regions of the, of the planet is really exciting to me. You look at places like Japan, where we've got a real vibrant 
alumni community. You look at places like Hong Kong. I know Steve is off there later next week to help them celebrate all of the good work that's taken place at that side of the planet. So there, there, there are just pockets of, of activation out there that I find thrilling. Great. Um, I love your vision of the outer reaches of the planet. Um, so we've gone big and we've gone broad. Yes. Let's come right back here to 02139. When you are back in Cambridge, where do you go? What are your favorite places on campus? Oh, well, I gotta say, coming back to campus, as you can tell, is energizing. You know, it's like, it's like plugging back into the source. And I, I tell my wife, and she's like, oh, you're so MIT. And, <laughs> Have fun over there. <laughs> Because you, you leave and you, you know, the journey is long and then you get off and you're dragging and then suddenly you show up in Kendall Square and you just come alive. It's just remarkable. I find, first off, the Kendall Square precinct to just be incredible. Yeah. I remember when I was an undergraduate, that was the no-go zone, right? <laughs> you had to go over there to the bursa and you do whatever you had to do and get back to your dorm room as quickly as possible. Now, that entire place with the new museum, if you haven't been to the new MIT museum, I strongly encourage you to check it out. It is remarkable. That in and of itself is transformational. But no trip back to campus will be complete without going to DAPA and seeing the facilities there. I used to play a lot of squash. There's a squash court up there that I enjoy just walking around and reminiscing and being nostalgic. And then, of course, Legal Seafoods, where we have our traditional yes, lunch. That's right. With Crab cake. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. Those are all good spots. And I bet everyone in this room is thinking of what is their favorite spot when they come back to campus. Uh, so we've talked about the strategic plan. President Kornbluth was here this morning. She referenced her inaugural address. She said a few things about what she's interested in learning about, the vision that's coming into shape. And one of the reasons, as you know, the strategic plan is three years only, is we wanted to just make sure that um, we didn't create a 10-year plan that would box us into something that wasn't going to be in alignment with the new president of MIT, because we didn't have a new president quite yet. As you've heard her speak, and as we've started to work through the strategic plan, are there ways that you're thinking about um, you know, that we might align cl more closely with her her vision. Yes. Maybe we can have a conversation about that, however you'd like to do it. Yes. Well, first off, it's, it's wonderful and refreshing to welcome Sally yeah. into the role. I think everyone would agree that every minute you spend with her, you leave inspired by how quickly she has sort of got it. Yeah. Right? That combined with a sense of authenticity that just welcomes you in and makes you feel comfortable. There's no pretense there. You can just sit and have a chat, not unlike the chat we're having now, which is just remarkable. I'm very excited by the priorities that she has outlined. They are big topics. They're hard topics. We heard of one previously on AI. That is capturing, I'm in the AI world. It's something we talk about with our customers and there's a lot of sense making going on. So the fact that MIT has raised its hand and say, we're gonna play a role to shepherd the world through is really exciting. Climate is a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone can crack the problem, it will be MIT. So that also is very exciting. I think the role we can play as alumni to stay connected is in the first instance, there's a lot being put out from MIT right now on these important vectors. So stay abreast, mm -hmm. whether it's reading the daily, the slice, following Sally's podcast, et cetera. Because in order to be effective ambassadors, we have to be students of what's currently the position of MIT or what's happening so that we can have informed conversations with our cohorts, with our friends and our communities as well. So that's. That's how I'm thinking about it right now. It's a fast moving landscape. Yes. So there aren't really books to be, read, to be read about this right now. It's really just staying, 
trying to keep pace with what's going on at the Institute. And I think she's talking about it that way as well. I mean, when she puts out these ideas, she's careful to say, um, maybe she's careful to say, to ask, did I just promise the world that we would solve climate uh, change? <laughs> I think maybe I did, and maybe that's not really what I meant to do. So, you know, it's sort of provisional. The, sh the things are taking shape. They're um, AI, biotech, whatever it might be. It's a conversation that's happening uh, at MIT right now, and, and we're a part of it, and we'll figure out what our part is. Um, and many of you professionally are out there in the world doing things about this as well, um, which is tremendously important and valued by her already. She's aware. Um, so let me just check the time because we have, all right, we're good. Um, when you think about, you know, we mentioned the big tent of MIT and the Alumni Association in your presentation. And you talked about MIT common ground. What, what do you think is the underpinning importance of that, of this community being so aware of what it can do together? Um. Well, I think it plays on, on what we have covered so far. I forget who it is that said, if you want to go far, you can go alone. But if you want to do great things, go together. Mm -hmm. I may be butchering that to some extent, but. It's a good idea. But yeah. It is a good idea, let's go with that for a minute. And I think that the, a large part of the, of the power of the Alumni Association is in the connective tissue. And one of the things that always fascinate me is coming back to reunions. We just had our 30th reunion this past June. And you know, clearly all of us in this room, or many of us in this room, are hyper-connected to MIT. But when you reconnect with your classmates who probably come back once every five years, once every 10 years, and you see that oh wow moment mm -hmm. when they walk around campus or they do a tour of a lab or they listen to a lecture, and you go, yeah, that's the 747 problem. And what I mean by that is, for those of us who travel a lot, it's remarkable once you get on an aircraft and it takes off, you lose track of how fast it's moving and whether or not it's oriented, right? And then suddenly the captain says, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to land in San Francisco. And you go, wow, how did that happen? And I think one of the roles we can play as alumni leaders is to help orient our fellow alumni of how quickly the aircraft is moving and how many changes are happening at the same time. So I think that's important to bear in mind. And a lot of things we take for granted yeah. in terms of what's happening, the excitement, the, the, the progress that our alumni colleagues, particularly the ones that are further away, are not necessarily aware of. Completely agree. Uh, and that is a role that everyone in this room can play as well, just out in the world, in their communities, making sure that um, over cocktails or hamburgers or whatever it might be, that we're all reminding ourselves of the amazing things that are happening here, the incredible intellect that, and talent pool that lives here together and then goes out into the world and still loves one another's company. Um, Robert, thank you for that time and just sharing a little bit more of your perspective on the Alumni Association and leadership in our community. I hope you all feel as I do that I am a fabulous partner. You all have a fabulous leader for the year ahead. We're going to be up to good things, and you all are essential to that. So um, I think it might be a good time to say we will be taking another break and heading to lunch. There will be a networking lunch. You can talk about what you've learned today, what you're doing in your communities. Lunch will be in this room. And then following that, you can see in your program, there are various training sessions you can go to to learn more about the Hive Right that was mentioned, to learn more about the strategic plan that was mentioned, to learn about um, the big tent of MIT and our community and how you know, across all of the uh, social pressures and differences of opinion that exist in the world, we still are one community that has a common ground. A couple different, a couple different things that you can participate in. So please, um, let's give Robert a round of applause and then let's have some lunch. <laughs>